Hello all and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 261st New Social Environment. I'm Anya, a production assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for the two, uh, sorry, the 29th Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Stephen Ira. Each Wednesday, a guest curator invites a number of poets who they admire to the new social environment to read political poetry. And we are so thrilled to have the poets Camden Hilliard, Jackie S., Trish Salah, and Max Crandall, and of course, Stephen Ira, here with us today. A few quick notes before we get started. We'll be recording this gathering for the Rail Archive, so if you prefer not to be seen, you can disable your camera by pressing the stop video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. We won't have a Q&A today as we do during the lunchtime conversations, but feel free to introduce yourself and shout out where you're from in the chat. The Rail team will be helping out with tech if you have any questions. And closed captions are available by pressing the live transcript, transcript button. Um, that's at the bottom of the Zoom screen between the record and reactions buttons. We start all of our events with two important announcements, acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are located in the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters still belonging to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi and Lenny Lenape peoples of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of white settler colonialism, the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy, and centuries of US imperialism. We would like to take a moment for those murdered last week in Atlanta by a man who targeted women of Asian descent and for those murdered just two days ago in Boulder in another horrific instance of gun violence. Please join me for a moment of silence to honor those who live on and to hold in our hearts those we have lost. Thank you. And now to introduce today's curator. Stephen Ira is a writer, filmmaker, and performer. His poetry has appeared in or is forthcoming in venues like Diagram, Poetry, Fence, American Poetry Review, and Tagberg. As an actor, he has appeared at venues like La Mama, Etc., Dixon Place, and The Stud, creating roles in new plays by poets like Max Crandall and Bernadette Mayer. As a filmmaker, his work has appeared at Outfest, New Fest, and the Philly Trans Wellness Conference. In 2013, he was a Lambda Literary Fellow. In 2019, he completed an MFA at the Iowa Writers Workshop. He is currently a poetry editor at the speculative magazine, Strange Horizons. Stephen, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and thank you for, for joining us today. This is really exciting for me. Um, these are four poets who mean so much to me, two people who I consider sort of um, really important peers, really important colleagues, and two people who I think of as really having um, set the stage like a generation, a micro generation prior um, in terms of um, trans writing. And uh, yeah, so this is really, really exciting. Um, I'm going to read uh, one poem of my own to kind of just open the space. Um, and then I'm going to read another poem of my own at the end. Um, so this poem is called The Cis People. The cis people were frightened. They seemed to have appeared so suddenly. The cis people reeled and their robes spun out over the earth. On land, there were still outposts. There were encampments. The cis people were sad. They gnashed their teeth. In winter, in the snow, looking out at it, they were quietly moved. The cis people lay awake, naming names they had known. The cis people decided to begin by touching one of each, dog, pig, horse. On the lake, there were houseboats, in the beach towns, gold. The cis people were rejected at the gender clinic and learned. The cis people heard their own names and so committed arson, prosaic decision. There were no cis people. Considered intersectionally, the theory did not make sense. The cis people had beautiful dances, slow, melancholy, with tall, spindly puppets. 
just as people cooked cabbage and chewed at night a prescribed number of times. They were religious. They were in grief, gnashing their teeth. The cis people had things to say, but fell silent. In the city, at the building and loan, at the in the building and loan, in the ski lodge, the cis people in their palatial homes had big old faces like raw marble, as hard to climb as the curved sky, the one our ancestors knew, that was spotted yet somehow featureless and feared. When the moon rang and rang up there, I knew I could feel them. Thank you. Um, if you if you want to look at that um, on the page or rather on the screen, um, you can find that poem um, in Diagram. So if you Google like Steve and Ira Diagram, you'll find it. Um, now um, I'm really excited to introduce to you uh, my friend, my sister, uh, Cam Hilliard. Um, Cam is a person with so much integrity and so much talent. And then on top of that, just to twist the knife, um, they're a really wonderful, enjoyable person to be around. Um, yeah, Camden Ishmael Hilliard was born in La Jolla, California. They settled in Oahu, Hawaii. Camden is a writer, teacher, and young professional. They hold a BA in American Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and an MFA in Poetry from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Camden, a non-binary black settler who goes by Cam, works on issues of surveillance, race, queerness, and American politics. They're thankful for support from the National Young Arts Foundation, the Davidson Institute, Sarah Lawrence College, the U Cross Foundation, Banff Center, and Callaloo. Cam's writing appears in West Branch, The Black Warrior Review, Togwerk, Denver Quarterly, The Columbia Review, and other publications. Formerly, they served as an AmeriCorps VISTA and held Maytag teaching writing and Fluflot fellowships at the University of Iowa. <laughs> That's one of the big uh, pros of going to the workshop is you get to say Fluflot fellowship. <laughs> um, currently, they are the Ennisfield Wolf Fellow in Publishing and Writing at the Cleveland State University Poetry Center, a reader at Flypaper Lit, and an incoming board member at Vita Women in Literary Arts. Um, how exciting. So um, yeah, please join me in welcoming um, Cam Hilliard. Thank you. Yeah, the Vita thing just happened. It's awesome. I'm so excited. I'm like, I don't do drugs anymore. I have a planner. I'm ready. So it's going to be amazing. Um, well, like hard. We know. Okay. So I have some poems. They're all new. These are all newer. They're not in my book that's coming out next spring because that's just stressful. So new poems. It's going to be fun. So this first one is called Not Awesome to Enjoy Money. I love you over my head, over heel, over no approximation of you on the rocks with lime spiked, not flat or grown in or flown in. I love you in so much. I'd eat you if eating you didn't make you less you than not eating you would make of your reflection of my worldviews. Your syntax, my syntax. If not illegible or adjacent in so far that I am not a member of the species of, the genius of, the death of, the taxes of, the missionary of, the of the insofar that grammar is a system of meansing that wants nothing but words from itself to make. Listen, one need not gaze at any abyss, but what we got uglied on, glorious, sick. Um, okay, so this next poem, I don't know how to describe it, but this is how the title looks, right? So it's like, um, God damn, that's like the kind of typing we have here. So it's called, and now you mean I have to manage my emotions? Have Monday meetings among thyself, ourselves and yourselves too? <sighs> This is another, yes, another song. Protocol, rose bread, 
Sunday begs to be dragged, I would never have gotten away with this. The part for them latchkey kids, them greed goons. I am no one's grind mode, for I have gone unprecious finally. Uh oh, uh oh. Sorry, my computer said the Wi Fi was weak, which was stressful. I'm here with you, is what that means. Okay, one sec. I am no one's grind mode, for I have gone unprecious finally in poetry. Can you believe it? Poetry. It has pavements, which I pound, and free lights, which I down. So not a peep, no sugar, no secret, true and pure intentions of Christian capitalism. Like how we've all seen too much to keep feeling like we're fine. Like how they'll kill you and hurt. And that is only how you will know it is hurting. So this poem is the frowny face with the negative eyebrows. That's the title. Can you see that? You saw it? Yeah. I don't know how to say that. I think it's like, <sighs> sure, money is pretty useful. Pretty, pretty, insofar that it charts life possibility making in America, which is the world. Weary fault who confuses himself with how meaning unfurls. <clears throat> okay, so I've been writing these poems that are affirmations and complaints, and they go together. So unfortunately, I have no new affirmations. <laughs> I only have complaints. So complaints. I am disturbed by the quality of life left to top scoring applicants from the United States with application money. My mother reminds me it as the white tip of shit, which is the top of something troubled. I don't think this is a delineation of value or an assertion that shit which is totally the shit is shit, but that everybody is like, oh, I'm sorry. These are new, these are new, and I didn't double space this. I don't think this is a delineation of value or an assertion that shit, which is totally the shit is shit but that shit is not what I deserve or what I want to love my people with. So worse is that everybody is like grind, grind, mine out the mine, gone mindless going for the white tip of shit. I like that in my mom's version, white is the color of the shit tip. This does not mean that whiteness is any kind of final state, pinnacle, affirmative condition, position worthy of moral defense, cultural or biological condition, or sensical ontology, but that whiteness has securitized itself on top of a big pile of stolen land and money like a dragon. I guess I also mean that the whole of the shit, toe to tip, is money and land obtained with legal magic and murder and extra legal low blows. And you fucking people actually think it's my idea to describe them, to recast the centuries of violence in colochrome. You should go the fuck home, seriously, go home. <clears throat> They're complaints. It's great, I feel fucking awesome. Um, okay, so this is called, today is okay, but then there's capitalism again. Things do not get better. They go on dancing. It is my fear of death. What will be willed in passing next? Nothing careful about settling the moment, not until now. Have I been sold proof of this happiness? And honestly, I'm kissed by bliss, though suddenly am unasked. And 
am dislikedly a part of it. Okay. Okay, I have three more. If, if, if I am ruining the clock, someone should visually signal that. Um, so this is called, <laughs> I was watching TV with my fiance and uh, he was like, hey, as a teacher, is there such a thing as a stupid question? I was like, no, but there are bad ones. And I was like, let's talk about some bad questions. Uh, so I was thinking about whiteness and bad questions. Stupid question, bad question. This white woman convinced me. Clean water, good air, vested interest in diversity. Last time this happened, it was very, come in, it'll be great. But oh fuck, it was horrible. In fact, horrible in the very ways I thought it couldn't be because we were literally talking diversity, inclusion, equity. How could I middle everything? Change in turn, interrupting, and suddenly all of these white women are holding policy manuals and pitchforks and good trouble black people by their ankles. And everyone's yelling, see, see, this is all we wanted, ease, togetherness, and you had to go fuck it up. But no, see, I do not want inclusion. I do not want neoliberalism's spinal inversion. Neoliberalism's spinal tap, neoliberalism's ontological frack, 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 as children in Long Island, New York, it was absolutely the frick, which thank heavens you haven't gone to yet so we can go together for the first time. And the fact that I can't keep my thoughts or lines on any proprietary plumbed sex track, I can't find my attention's way back to some stable relationship to my loving, self-loving Black. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this complaint and then one more poem. Um, this is so fun. Uh, okay. So I, 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 uh, I have schizoaffective disorder, right? So which I have uh, symptoms of schizophrenia. So there's medications for that, which is good. Those same medications gave me diabetes. I passed out one day on a workout in the middle of the fucking street, <laughs> woke up in the ICU with diabetes from taking these medications. So it's interesting because the medications I have to take make part of me way less healthy. So I'm thinking about that in this complaint and also just trying to like deal with that fact as a person. So I appreciate you letting me reach out in this moment and um, hopefully not being like, why is this happening? <laughs> okay, complaint. You know what is more effective than antipsychotic medication? Walks. Long, exhausting walks. Ass sweat. Cheek work. The low, slow go up into what I was one to three days acute or seven to 21 long days term ago. White mental health professionals love to tell you, I don't think people belong in the hospital, like they care about you and it's trash. It's why every time I lie, like of course my head, I would like to bang, smash, thrash into the throat of right now's crash pad. So cool it to myself, say, LOL, IDK, do you want me to kill myself? Dovetail svelte into every horror, hot boxing the house party. It's Dutch oven heavy, the doctorate of getting the fuck out of here. My skills include the daily activities of living. They're soft, wearing down a the medicinal lean, if I can keep the room of my mind and my heart clean, if I can keep smiling like I could push to start, if to automotive dream, if to resist communicating with any mental health professional about the problem of race. 
a problem in which they are so intertwined, they seem unable to understand its effects. And instead, they tend to assume that the particular paranoias, joys, bitternesses, and bifurcations left to blackness are mania. Machine ordered like a sleeper attack. The always already of my apology for yelling, coming out as yelling, because I am apologizing for my coming out at all and my wondrous, terrible yelling. Fuck that. Um, this is my last poem. Uh, and this has been super fun, Stephen. I love you. Uh, I've known Stephen since 2012. Uh, and Stephen has just been a light um, in my life. I could cry. Yeah, a very good friend. And I just, um, I'm loving that as I get older, I can like fall into that friendship in new and exciting ways. So last poem, you guys all rock. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Um, thank you, New Social Environment. My day without politics. End the 12 hour night. End against printed sunlight. My day without politics ends my legs in 15s, 16s, 14s, depending upon law. My mountains, institutional moles, hills rolled out in already political, trimmed down or bowled into or over a tunnel, a mine, a dark tunnel of mine, firm fine, toe ten, place square foot on floor, wooden in so far that it looks like wood and wooden in so far that when I say wooden, we both think striped, naughty, dead bored. My day without politics ends my day in so far that it happens yesterday, tomorrow, and again in whatever a year will be by then. Um, you guys are awesome. I feel like we've become a lot closer. Hope you have a great day. Kim, there are literally endless um, things that I could say. I love you so, so much. Um, imagine you meet somebody and you're like 20 and that person's like 18 and they can already like basically do that. And you're just like, what, wait, what, like, what? <laughs> um, so having um, just uh, been able to share my sister's work with you, I get to now share with you my dad. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, uh, so next we're gonna hear from the poet, Max Crandall. Um, Max Crandall is a poet, playwright, and founder of the theater company Beautiful Mo Moments in Popular Culture. His performance novel, The Nancy Reagan Collection, Future Poem 2020, made the NYPL's Best 100 Books of 2020, Lit Hub's 65 Favorite Books of the Year, and is a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in Transgender Poetry. Max is Interim Associate Director of the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program at Stanford University. Um, and as I said, uh, Max is, is, is my dad. Um, uh, so please put your hands together for Max Crandall, everybody. Stephen, you're amazing. Uh, my son, uh, that's the first time I've ever been introduced as a dad, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Brooklyn Rail. This is awesome to be here with everyone. Um, I can't believe it. There's so many people here, so many friends. Uh, okay, today I'm gonna read from my new book, my, my uh, performance novel called The Nancy Reagan Collection. Um, it's about AIDS archives and intergenerational memory. And one thing I mean by a performance novel is that it was I made it to be performed, but I haven't been able to perform it since we've all been under quarantine. Uh, so I try out different things when I read on Zoom and today I'm trying out a new thing. So I'm gonna put a, a link in the chat. I thought I accidentally erased my whole theater company website when I made this, but it actually just went to the top of the website. So if you wanna play along at home, um, 
you can click there. And, and what it holds is uh, images that are activated by my text. So um, almost line by line, this whole book is kind of animated by images, by song lyrics and other things. Um, and it's 10 a.m. in California. So I decided I'd read some storytelling today. Uh, so we're gonna read from the beginning of the book. And one thing you should know is that every other chapter is a kind of narrative through line of the book told from the perspective of an unnamed narrative, narrator. And as the story is unfolding, there's um, historical stuff at the bottom of the pages and different kinds of things um, that are happening alongside. So I'm gonna start by reading, uh, by reading two of those historical um, things so you can get a flavor for them. The lone photograph framed 1990 I possess of Joan Quigley, Nancy's astrologer, is worn with elements. It must have gotten wet, a flood perhaps, or merely rain, a glass of water. Whatever it was, this contamination enhances the photograph's aura. Joan's on the phone with two astrological charts spread before her, right hand prone on the table holding tortoise shell spectacles. She appears to be sleeping, two eyelids closed studying the charts, a mask at work. David Jones, florist to Hollywood, dead at 78, newsprint, file folder, J11. Nancy never pays for anything, tight as a drum. Even in later years, she salutes the name of her florist up a flagpole, David Jones. When people send her flowers, her chosen florist banks the orders as credit in Nancy's account rather than delivering. Whenever she needs to send flowers, Nancy just picks up the phone and sings, all free, a heist. Everyone has a moment when they won't go back, when sh becomes shove, double for nothing. Mine is a story about control, about reading everything there was to know. Most of what we could control early on became known to us through speech, small bites of knowledge shared aloud, difficult to digest without devising otherworldly ways of remembering. A moment. The two of us, me and my doppelganger, sit alone in the cafe early afternoon. A quick brunch, leaning back in the booth, always helps us calm down, set right without that lasso in our throats. <clears throat> In the old days, what did you think about the role of sentiment in film, especially for actresses searching for truth? Acting is what we had in common and the erroneous assumption that the long durée of our lives would consist primarily of flouting the rules. We'd seen Lady Sings the Blues, our travel built networks, all wise in the ways of earth. I had friends with friends on a leash. The sacred center is where we lived now and him, my destiny, my one and only glove clasped in the oval of my palm to trace the uplift so symmetry of his face when his lips parted. He was about to speak, to say, me with you, at me, a song and an ask. But shutter flash through the window glaring with day, there she was, Nancy Reagan, the high queen of Sacramento rushing by on the street. Right there at the intersection of our three lives, my muscles locked down and closed forever, helpless and beating around the one woman who could. In the flash, I couldn't tell the difference. Change became my life force, my magnetism a dream. That dream became him, the annals, another me. This excess belongs symbolically to Nancy. Myselves were a bundle I offered again and again. In response, she introduced me to everyone, one flower at a time. This poem is called Dazed From Which Distraction or Mouth of the Hudson. Over the year, Gipper rooted for me. He really was considering how weak I'd become. Something of a mirage is being deserted. His concern, a canopy I was held beneath. Violence is violence nonetheless. I was beginning to stoop low on account of my accident near El Cielo. Thus encumbered, I rode the Staten Island Ferry nearly every day to work. From my window, I studied souls angling up, 
into arch, my mustache if I grew one. Back then, I was entirely advertising an opera, disco and drugs. Serenely composed, if little thought, in company beside them danced. What I imagined was an escape so many times before. There was what we called a mouth hole in the back room. I prided myself on hardly ever opening my eyes. One time I smelled gasoline, its sharp erasure. It was just like me to be a midtown janitor beaten to a pulp after work in the dark, nowhere to go again, and boom, that's when the markets crashed. Suddenly the bars were empty. When I met him, I was limping through a bandaged risk, talking to anyone who could listen with people who didn't exist. The way she looked in me and smiled, the gaze, here was the Brutus apocalypse to keep us grounded, cord connecting face to air. Thoughts were coming like a pump where the rhythm made more sense than the how, the high why. We possessed no ideal, no vision of what overtopping loss across the banks would look like. Within that horizon, the people you loved became the people you hated. What you hated slipped in where you loved. I fell for him as quickly as the sickness. Whenever he made a move, he had a custom of pushing his long slope of cheek toward the nearest exit. Then one day, the surgeons informed me with great enthusiasm. We're rigging him up a brand new stomach. And this is the last section I'll read today. It's called Always a Hunted. In between the Nixon gigs that took them around the globe for free, Nancy needed to get things done. Right and left, putting the help in a hand basket and playing a show to the ode. Since meeting Nancy, I'd had the distinct pleasure of landing on the shores of hell, so to speak, where demon people profit from doom. This was a dense area to cover on foot, peering out of the eyes of someone who was supposed to be me it was urgent to see what I could find in a maze covering names and a feeling of politics, to ascertain my weaponry within this series of berserk emergencies. From what I'd gathered, Nancy needed to move out of a mansion and fast. But where will you go, I ventured, choosing an upbeat TV voice that I instantly filled me with regret. Nancy smiled one of her political grins. I'm working on it, but I could really use 2000 to get this realtor out of my hair. Glimmer. I swallowed my own bitter pill, paying suit to Nancy's must fund with generous donation, whereupon I was gifted a spoon with which I began a tactful excavation of Nancy's head. She had opened the door, of course. I'm not rude. I noticed at once that Nancy's hairdo was a dead giveaway the kind of basket case that really bites the dust when you blow holes on it, by which I mean each follicle, root, and death-defying strand acquainted me in an instant with the euphemisms of power. Although she hadn't yet achieved the hallowed grandma's nest that she would perfect in the White House, her bob was getting shorter and shorter by the minute. I thought of a stick of dynamite, the wick burning down. I reawakened, covered head to toe in my own grime, phantoms or pheromones cluttering my head. Nancy explaining the stakes of her persistent world. I've been sick about this contractor for weeks. I've laughed and I've cried, I tell you. But yesterday it dawned on me that the mansion is H-A-U-N-T-E-D. I jerked hard at the shoulder, startled by our vocal togetherness. As she slid my stack of green across the table, a wet substance began to bead at her scalp. Was there a crack on the surface of her skull? I began to worry what fissures foreshadow. Moral bankruptcy, itself seeming to spring. Faith, the ploy is what you make of it. Bless you, child, Nancy oozed. Ronnie and I really value your support arrived from distinct corners of the globe pouring in at first through a cascade of homosexual anguish, similar to its root force, preservation. 
As self-made protective shields expanded around us, we became dimly aware of small villages on the outskirts of us, villages founded in endings and care. Thank you. Um, thank you, Max. Uh, so uh, discovering um, Max's work and uh, making a play with him for the first time was sort of this moment in my life where I was like, oh, that is the trans fag lyric. Like I, I you know, through, <laughs> through a series of coincidences, I guess, have found it. <laughs> um, and uh, our, our next reader is also someone for whom um, I, I discovered uh, Trisha's work and sort of was like, Oh, okay. I, I, so I, I will understand some things now about um, this pleasurable relationship I've been having to language. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to be able to share her work with you today. Um, Trish Salah lives and works in Toronto and is an associate professor of gender studies at Queen's University, which is located, located on traditional Ashinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory the author of Wanting in Arabic, which won a Lambda Literary Award, and of Lyric Sexology Volume 1. She is a Pushcart nominated poet and has poems in recent issues of Mizna and Tripwire, and in We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics. Um, she is editor of the Journal of Critical Race Inquiry and is co-editor of special issues of TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, on cultural production, and of Arc Poetry Magazine, featuring work by trans, two-spirit, and non-binary writers. Um, Trish, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Stephen, and Brooklyn Rail for doing this thing and everybody for showing up. Um, I'm going to uh, start with a poem uh, by Mira Soleil Ross uh, from the first issue of Gender Trash magazine uh, back in 1993. This poem is called Decriminalizing for Power. And I would like to dedicate it not only to Ross, uh, but to those killed, those sex workers killed uh, recently in Georgia. Decriminalizing for Power, a loose woman, a student from out of town with neither loans nor bursaries, a single mother without a dime, a transvestite junkie or simply an ambitious outlaw, decriminalizing essentially to regain our dignity. Communicating, sharing, regrouping, and organizing ourselves, speaking for ourselves without being accused of conspiration, decriminalizing to end fear, being free to choose financial independence through selling our bodies, our beauties, our sexuality, decriminalizing to subdue the stigma. Our freedom we wish to keep having control at all times, decriminalizing and not legalizing, we reject the state as pimp. The urgency to value our human rights, freedom of expression, freedom to travel, freedom to immigrate, to work, to get married, to have children, respect, for our privacy, decriminalizing to legitimize our profession, le vice commercialise, in the eyes of the judges, the doctors, our families, our lovers, and this society, decriminalizing to no longer be ashamed to work the streets, our heads held high and proud, decriminalizing to affirm our sexual pleasure, decriminalizing for power. And Gender Trash One, I encourage you to look it up if you can or haven't already. Uh, so I'm gonna read two poems from the recent special issue of Mizna, um, focused on queer and uh, trans Arab poetries, and then some new work. This is called Prayer Glitch. One sister remembered, one not, one curated voices in a song cycle, one divides the ocean, a drifter. It is difficult to be molten, alone. Drum the breakers and vanish, teach the young without force. Evacuated in silence, not knowing, as reading seeds the horizon, all thought only of glass. Desired like a minor nothing, hooking up, having had a sex, arguing with heavy liquor, 
a mask. Lonely through the park to the bar, once could not yet be taken up, the act of only writing poetry. Center have and childlike report, sibling questions bred apart, dare memories compression. River of words, rushing cavities, claimed seasonal every girl in plague only to repeat. And this poem is called Blurred Witness. What is required by this history? A rage muse, it is your body still. Encircling the city of your lover, wander the written path. When you try to speak of home, what comes out is kisses, birds. Past another possible remove, how do you become a stranger? Faces thinly papered over, despite how alike we look. Her past or his an awful trust, without country or reference. To arrive, I stay a bed for days inside a house within another house. Try to retrace what was cast out, quiet of the grip of voices. And uh, that poem and a number of the ones I'm going to read uh, move back and forth between some time I spent in Beirut and uh, uh, trying to write, trying to pick up the rudiments of a language that I still haven't picked up the rudiments of, and, uh, and dealing with a, a psychotic break that I was um, sort of in the wake of. Um, a plague of hindsight. Down to the small moon, falling into family romance, half submerged, you might be drowning in love. How you lay so still, a million screens, inches from touching masks. The shoals enclose a familiar story. Data streams like your study lead to the sea. Passing looks, massing opulent armature, it's sexy, cheap, online. A proposal to elect a face past its gate, or gulf of marriages, wander between those two. Breathe succor for the vigilant, Brood of our youth become solid, shadows line the face, asking, what is this form for? Two, irony of a dream derived, a wider wound than most. The suit is new, possibly tailored, your first. As if appearing per your different choice, chase down Ginsburg's constant farewell of forms, saying ungoodbye to what didn't exist. Finger ranged paper mache of teenage arousal, delirium muddles your past, an orphan to come ellipsis. Long lashed forecasts from the East Village to Morningside at 4 a.m. overtake your body, too thin a fen. Regret collects armaments, crossing off schemata from dusk to fuck. Can we say when a big gay buck bucks, tight out of the bone, begs a notion? Small price to prize nation with an open air prison. A queen stiletto all cocked up, cocked shore, moon kissed as iron shod. You will take what you can get. Jamezi wakes to, I don't know what is a room. No reprieve. Beside itself, this city is not itself. I'm not of it either. Behind my eyes, the light is continuous, fractures, time's moment. Outside, hustling bodies and the rain, I lost the device long dreamt could capture. Walking is good intuition, if thought is not integrated, spiraling. The foreigner whose unknown tongue climbs these solitary steps, exempting the voices that dream and practice to sleep. Night brings music's envelope and a body taken how to want the war dancing beyond your eyes, beyond your window. Scratch that. For want of writing every day of rewind, no imagined otherwise, as if I could draw a line in time. I say before I was sick, like I used to say after my breakdown, a very long while to press the box cutter in, impress the surface as much as you can. That was then a then wished 
I would then withdrawn or now, withdrawn on now. In the waiting room, waiting for what? I watch other frightened bodies, intake after intake. I know I don't know what I want. I know this medicine makes me ill. I know this place is not safe. This is the institution calling. Are you an envelope, a questionnaire? Are you in line with your groceries, your blood? Are you late 19th century or later? All hope goes south. We would like to know your future affiliation, your heat signature, your credit report. Is this your first bank robbery, rupture, tenure? What is that enjoyment in your eye? Speaking or spoken, how was your in-between? Do you lie to him? How long have you or have you ever been married? At 40, the average of our babies is on Sunday. Do you prefer mass with Lawrence Welk bubbles? Peruse the veil between worlds. We believe in you. Every day is lesbian love. Don't be rude on the bus. Did you not recognize desire hers? For an eye across your signature. We are a long way away from the animal you made. And I'll read two more, if that's okay. Marked. When is one in a poem and not in doubt? If the page has become untrustworthy, of course you as well. I would like to list the things I know. It is a short list and we say the world is dying. Who has time for a short list? The world is dying and tenacious returns, snow and ice cast as dim and fading hope. What we hope is that we are survivable for something beyond this awesome fatality. Who are we killing in the untimeliness of this science? No, not science. Derision like there is no equal. Algorithms are precise in their negation of all loss. A self abstains as if a self could. My living is losing its foothold. Marked, we're off and turning. And this last one is called Parallel Advances. It is smaller here than what comes next, because what I love flowers actually, as if much deferred, much fixed up, ready to pick up, move mountains. Suppose it is a small bend to the orchid, a single one, miles of smooth white, what is alive, these fields in Dawson. Tread lightly upon what is yours, not mine, not earth nor stone. But a river is a kind of torpor as it crosses a town lit all night, a skew shadows bright, a party kind of feeling, not a figure for. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Um, that was really wonderful. And particularly, thank you so much for bringing uh, gender trash into the space. Um, if people aren't familiar with gender trash, oh yeah, thank you, Kay. If people aren't familiar with Gender Trash, I highly recommend clicking on that link in the chat and, and checking it out. Um, this makes me so nostalgic for that specific um, summer when I was in Max's play, Underwater Reading, and I was really sort of like, I was reading the Gender Trash work for the first time. And I remember like, like a, I remember like sitting in a restaurant and like reading Lyric Sexology volume one and like having Kay's essay about Gender Trash like open on my phone. <sighs> okay, um, our next reader is um, Jackie S. Um, so uh, Jackie S. is the author of Daryl, Clash, May 2021, a writer in several forms and under several heteronyms unified for the moment. So far, her writing has appeared in Vetch, The New Inquiry, The Zahir, We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics, Beach Mag, and of course, Twitter, at Jackie underscore S, E S S, to name a few highlights. Um, Daryl is her first novel. I really want to encourage people to buy it. Last night, um, I heard a, a sort of deranged, slightly unhinged um, giggling coming from the other room. And I went in and it, my partner Liam looked up at me and said, I started Jackie's book. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, without further ado, um, please welcome Jackie S. Yes. Thank you, All right. Um, I, I, should I be waiting for like a spotlighty thing, or am I am I just on? I'm on right now. Okay. No, I think you're good. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Sweet. Uh, and you all hear me. 
Um, wonderful. Okay, so, you know, anytime that there's like a radical anything, I'm a little bit like, uh, you know, is that why, why are people asking me to participate? But, uh, but I, I'm into it. And, and I feel like I'm really grateful to my friends who sort of badger me to continue to, to make, you know, empty political affirmations or, or whatever, or non empty political affirmations occasionally. Um, and uh, so I sent a few poems to this anthology called, um, uh, called We Want It All. And uh, I want to read one that they accepted and one that they didn't accept rightly. And so I rewrote it and it's so much better. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, Kay, I think is in the room. So, you know, she can, she can tell you, um, you know, please. Well, anyway, so uh, here's weather, which is in that book. I have the sound of your voice, the music you showed me and the thought that we would have hated one another. I mean, really hated if we had met when we were young. Now come to think of it, that's actually how it happened. But I get to know you anyway, because we both have presence, an occult sense everywhere of your having passed through. There's a flash in the spirit as impersonal as powder or unusual weather. There are these auroras and so on, slight incense on a frozen wind, then melt. Icebergs peeling off from the part of life that matters, which is the massive. Now those are the rules, that's a prompt, as I reminded anyone who'd listen. So that's, that's the one that's in there. And, and then here's, here's one that isn't, uh, whale. Gasping to the surface, graceless and alive, when whales do this, do they sing as they leap? I just got back from the wreck, from some dive. Honey, they talk, but it wasn't so deep. When I started, I wanted to speak about memory, how it might feel to remember or to prove. The Manchurian gigolo, thought revolved, a body unburdened beginning to move. Above all, intended to avoid cliche, to be untrammeled by the spokesman role, to speak of sex the way we really have it, to be sharp, to be lucid, and where it calls, to be cold. Not to say, but to expand the sayable, still afraid to say anything true, as though I'd been working for all of you, just holding a door for the rest to pass through. We search together for a perfect pain whose wail might make the perfect poem. Just one voice that's allowed to feel, and in lifting, it becomes our own. The corners we cut just to have a voice. What's disavowed to be always pursued? I couldn't say that I saw the face you'd made and that was it. I did it all wrong for you. Uh, maybe I'll publish that somewhere. Um, here's one that's an older poem called What Would Happen? Uh, cutting fruit, so effort effortlessly superior, you carry the knife and remind me that this world belongs to the others. Well, at least the future does. And all this is understood in the cult of M. I take a small bite, accept the curse and start over. Your light, your towering ambition and myself, oh, how lower than a worm and wishing that I would, sir, die, saying, I think this time I gotta sit this round out actually as though there were another. I think you grow weed now? The question still unresolved at time of writing, why would someone like you put yourself through this? I mean, what would even happen? Um, and that, that was from uh, 2017. And now I wanna read a little bit from a novel, which is not Daryl, uh, which is tentatively called Fruit. Uh, and uh, it uh, follows a uh, kind of a white passing mixed race guy who's uh, becomes a yoga teacher and falls in with a band of perfumers in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, so let's, let's see if I can do this without any context. I would love to do this without any context. Um, okay, so this, uh, the chapter is, uh, is blackberries and, and it's, uh, it's got a epigraph from, from Bowie, station to station. If you know the thin white Duke, you know, there's a funny thing about David Bowie. Everybody thinks about David Bowie, but not that character. That's the, that was the best one. It's really fucked up stuff that he was into at that time, but it's, it's really, it's, it's a good, good record. Anyway. Oh, I should say who these people are. I do have to do context. Fine, fine, fine. Okay, so he's, Adam at this point in the narrative, uh, he's in a relationship uh, with a kind of a trans woman who's very early in her transition named Ali and a friend of hers, Uthun, who's a little bit more, uh, uh, shall we say belligerent. And uh, they are going to go to a little, uh, little get together. Uh, on the sidewalk. Okay, here we go. Uh, Ali and Uthun took me to an FTP march, fuck the police. I wonder why I'm so much less invested in this stuff than they are. Maybe because I'm actually black. Well, sort of. But you only get one life. Are you going to stand up to these guys or not? 
We heard some impassioned speeches and cursed the whole thing, and I was sort of into it. For a second, I thought about power, what it would mean to stand up to it. I wasn't really doing that. It struck me that maybe my desire not to be a fake radical, not to play poor or play punk or play Peter Pan, maybe I'd left something on the table. Like nobody's a radical unless they do radical shit. And I don't, but maybe it doesn't take a different kind of person than what I am. Maybe it doesn't matter so much who you were before. So I wasn't lying about who I was, but I was lying kind of by omission, by never showing up in the one life I had. I was staying in my lane, yeah, in a convertible. But is this who I wanna be? The guy who plays tennis at the Claremont with high-class drug dealers and Google Glass guys? Like, I've got everything I need in Berkeley. The truth is right there. You get your spine straight, you get your body connected, and you stand in the light, and that's enough, exist. If people knew that, they wouldn't have to be rich. They wouldn't have to dominate other people. Maybe we wouldn't need police. Maybe they wouldn't have to do this stuff either. Some of the protesters seemed deformed by their anger and I watched as one then another started breaking windows. Guys who came alone, I mean, are they cops? Nobody knows who these people are, but I think that nobody wants to root them out either. Better to accept the free rider problem than allow the enemy to triangulate your tactics was what Uthun said. I think that's smart. Still, I'm not sure how well it works. It seems like a lot of people are content to not triangulate, just write your whole movement off as violent thugs. And I felt this inward re revulsion at anyone seeing me that way as a thug. That's my quarter maybe, like not acting up, but acting respectable. As we left the march, we turned the wrong way and I saw a girl throw a bottle at a line of riot cops and, and they were on us. Batons were falling and I was protecting Ali's body with mine. We got out, Uthun didn't. This is gonna be a whole thing, isn't it? When we got back to Ali, she was on Facebook all night. Suddenly she's an organizer. And I guess it's good not to abandon a friend, but I felt like maybe I ought to, I ought to be one too. When we got our clothes off. I saw the pigs had put a pretty good bruise on her. And I thought about Christopher Dorner. I wondered if I couldn't do it, like kill him, I mean. By the morning, I was pretty sure I didn't want to kill anybody. I checked Twitter and a local black group had shut down the highway, pretty brave. And I wondered why activism was so segregated and why, if I was going to get into it, if I, why I was going to go with my three quarters. Well, something about the Black Revolutionary Act never quite sat right with me, but you know, they got something to fight back against. It isn't an act. And why the hell am I saying they? I know somehow the same place I live, same area, South Berkeley, West Oakland, this place gave birth to groups like the Black Panthers. And now it's like student spillover, white punks who complain about gentrification. I mean, isn't that you? No, no, it's Blake. I mean, nothing changes from a couple of penniless white freaks moving in. The guilt they have about it is really just self-importance. What counts is who owns it, who builds it, and that's real money. That's who the cops are there to protect. They're certainly not protecting Uthun, who I guess had ended up in the bullpen with a lot of guys because she can't, hadn't changed any of her documents. How can someone be trans that long and not bother? Well, I guess when some people say they hate bureaucracy, there's a little more to it. Something in them that can't face it. They aren't fluent or they fold or it takes them back someplace that hurt. I never had that problem. So I suddenly wondered if it wasn't, maybe that wasn't how the white man got some of this stuff, like not just force and trickery, but creating a system that required continuous executive function just to protect what you had. So that's unnatural to be an ego all the time. That's an invention of the West. It drives us crazy, but it drives everybody else crazier. So we win. I wondered if the scent plot element, which you'll, you'll have to read the book for, wasn't just a more extreme version of that. So how do you stand up to it? Not protest, I think. I, I think it's all about getting your body and your mind right. Activism isn't bad, but it comes too much from the head. You're always writing manifestos and acting them out. And the content of the manifesto is always that my mind is the master of my body, not your mind, my mind. And what if there were no masters at all? See, that would be true anarchism. And I think that's true Zen as well. I sat for about 20 minutes distracted by my bruises and thought about the rigidity of the pose. Like they developed all this stuff before x-rays and painkillers and modern ergonomics. Do we really have to sit just this one way to meditate? I mean, everything can be meditation. I stood up and turned off my phone timer. Text from Ken. Um, I think, I'm not sure where we are with, uh, with time. Um, what do you what do you think? Do we do we have uh, time for a little little more? Or I, I I wasn't keeping track actually. Somebody I, do this. I think we do. Um, yeah, definitely. I think we're doing actually quite well on time. Oh, okay. All right, wonderful. Um, so let me see. So he's going to become part of a sort of a boutique uh, lifestyle consulting firm, um, and I maybe could just introduce you to some of them. Um, they're, they're fun people. Um, yeah, so they meet up at, uh, at Dolores Park um, with some of the guys. Kenward is his old friend uh, who started a company. 
uh, and he's basically a kind of a, you know, a, a research chemical sort of merchant. He's somebody who's interested in, in making new kinds of drugs uh, which have, uh, you know, interesting effects. And he wants to sort of fence that through a sort of a psychiatric and perfumery uh, kind of company. Um, weird, you know, like, uh, but anyway, so on Monday, I met Kenny at Dolores Park for a casual picnic with mannerism. Sorry, that's the name of the company. Meet Rafe. Rafe was apparently a friend of Kenny's from childhood, a fellow adventurer. He had a horrible accent that I initially placed as Australian, but he was a white South African, which is just an accent I never hear. He's quite an adventurous guy. He'd been a soldier of fortune or something for the De Beers company and then left Africa after the end of apartheid. When gay marriage happened, he sold his diamond holdings at a huge profit and moved to the Bay Area where he'd gotten lucky more than once as an angel investor. His posture was as good as mine and his teeth were incredible. I thought they must be veneers. It's rare to meet a guy like that, but I guess with Kenny, it's every day. What kind of friends are these? I wonder what Rafe would say if he knew that I was colored or you know, that's what they call it there. I quietly, quietly kind of wish that we had that kind of category in America. There's not really a name for what I am. So I became a white guy with a secret. You know, it'd probably make more sense for me to pretend I was some kind of ethnic white. Like George Harriman, you know, the cartoonist, he drew Crazy Cat. He did something like that. He let people call him the Greek. Well, I'm not Greek or Dutch or African. I'm just a regular white guy who happens to be tall, clean, ramrod, straight, spine. And did I mention well hung? I'll, I'll show you later. Now, I was with them, Rafe, Kenward, and this guy, Derek, who didn't speak at all. And they did all have gray eyes. And I tried to remember if Kenny always had. Oddly, I couldn't remember. It was like, it was like they were staring, we, we weren't staring into each other's eyes back in the day. It's kind of, it'd be sort of gay, right? I mean, I, maybe I could do that now, now that I'm queer, or maybe I'm naturally straight now again, since Allie's gender realization. Either way, I can't let petty emotions or even apparently operatic ones get involved here. You don't mix business and pleasure. Kenny introduced me as our new meditation teacher and the guys smiled. I realized I'd better play the part, but what part? Crazy wisdom, Trungpa stuff, you know, maybe I should be the party Buddha, or maybe I should be cold and anhedonic like the silent Derek who might've been half sharp down to his lunch, which was an enormous portion of very nice smelling sashimi. When Derek was finished, he made a strange bird-like sound and Rafe cut the tension, just the weirdness of that. Ignore Derek, he's nuts. Evidently, but what the hell was that sound? I never heard a person make that sound. Kenny handed, passed me a plastic cup of champagne with a few strawberries in it and told me to stay a while after. We should have some coffee and talk a few things over. And a coconut? Wouldn't have it any other way, man. You ever sharpen that knife? My man. All right. Um, I think let's let's just sort of stop it there. Uh, that was a, a little rough, but I, I never read that out uh, before. Um, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, amazing to get to read with all of you. Uh, I feel like I first saw uh, Trish Reed in, in 2014, and it, it meant a lot um, at the East Bay Poetry Summit, the second one. Um, so uh you know next time maybe black lights and uh you know who knows all right um thank you so much jackie that was great uh i i love the sneak preview of the new book that's very exciting um so yeah i, I want to just take a moment to to thank all the readers again um being able to hold these various different sort of lyric approaches to like the interior world and the exterior world, you know what I mean? Um, feels really good to me. Um, uh, I've had a rough week. I think we've all had a rough sort of like anniversary, right? Um, and this feels like a real bomb. So I, I appreciate it a lot. Um, I'm gonna close this out with um, a couple of my own poems. Um, I was just gonna do one, but now I, I feel very expansive now. Um, and maybe I'll try again to send you that picture Let's see, I think I can do it now. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> okay, I'll like put it on my Twitter or something after this. Um, so this poem is called Rage and Grief. Um, there's this Jean Reese quote um, where she says like, there, all of writing is a huge lake and there are big rivers that feed the lake like Tolstoy. And then there are trickles like Jean Reese, um, but you don't ma I don't matter, the lake matters. You have to keep feeding the lake, right? So I just told you that whole anecdote, but the epigraph to this poem is just um, a small part of that, which is, I don't matter, the lake matters. There's a goddess for me, attended by two tall black dogs named Rage and Grief. 
You're humiliated just like this whenever the familiar arrives. You believe nothing you have ever known could save you now. Stark, tall, black dogs attend the goddess with her tall head toward the sea. There's a goddess for me or anyone. That's the pattern. But sometimes you say, I feel like food for a lake I can't see or buy property on. I bend over my work while the goddess hovers, writhing in her famous stillness, like a paused fly between the two magnets inside of her dogs. I serve her. My reasons, though my own, remain unknown to me. Something is mine once I cannot touch it. I pace the strand with my hands folded, passing her columns passing her obelisks, her two tall dogs. You wanted a place by the lake. I wanted to sing a song there in the voice that I sing in at home. Um, okay, this poem is called, um, Why Do I Only Want Grammatical? Um, why do I only want grammatical coherence? Why is that my only note? I want grammatical and philosophical coherence as I see it. I resent cis anyone in the position of incoherence like a womb, a waiting room, why shouldn't they have it? Just because other white people praise me for this pose and punish me if I do not adopt it, doesn't mean no one should have any fun or need tell me a story instead of the forest, the pathless forest after which you get married, where I do in fact live, but am not permitted to visit. Um, okay, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read one more. Um, this poem's going to be in the Denver Quarterly soon, so that's 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 fun. Um, this poem is called uh, Transsexual Voice Contusion. Why don't conversion therapists just tell the kids, you'll know too much, it will become unbearable. Trans people will say they love you after one long evening making each other unhappy. Gay trans people, you can forget about it. Later, rip each other to shreds. In the queer bar for men, our men appear to be shitting, but on the internet, they really are. If I'd been male assigned, I'd be one of those fairies whose friends hover around with a bottle of Spiro, waiting for a light breeze to get him to transition. I don't think I'd take the pills, but you should. If I wasn't alone all that time, how come nobody came and got me? They did. Their fingers left these bruises on my voice. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, those are all very uh, sad poems, and I sort of was like, I should, <laughs> I should, I should read something happier. But maybe it's it's better just to be sort of honest about the the uh, affective moment that a large part of the world seems to be in. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, uh, please uh, check out um, everyone's work. Um, please buy Jackie's book. Please buy Max's book. It, they're both so great. Um, and um, also. Uh, Quite a few of these people are in We Want It All, um, an anthology of radical trans poetics. I'm in there. Um, and if you are looking for someone to sort of say, hey, this is what I think a radical trans poetics might be, and I'm really going to try to account for myself here, and I'm going to try to really describe what this sort of troublesome idea is, the introduction to that anthology, I think, does a very, very good job um, at that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for closing out with that beautiful reading. Um, and thank you, Cam and Max and Trish and Jackie um, for being here today um, and bringing everyone together. Um, and thank you to all of you who, who came out uh, this reading, um, to everyone in the audience and in the chat. Um, this has been truly lovely. Uh, just to close, uh, The Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and community events. So if you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to Keeping the Rail and our special projects like this one, free, relevant, and independent. And please join us tomorrow evening for a conversation on cultural analytics and AI aesthetics featuring Lev Manovich and Mackenzie Wark. Uh, we'll conclude tomorrow as we did today with a poetry reading by Stephen Ira. And that'll be at 7 p.m. Uh, right here in the Zoom. Um, and now I'm going to uh, change the settings so you should all be able to turn on your microphones to say goodbye. Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, Stephen. Bye. 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 Bye
Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you guys. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing people. Just love.